Colleagues, can I ask you to please stand for the procession? Well, uh, good evening, everybody, and uh, really it's wonderful to see such a uh, impressive turnout for our production this evening. Uh, it's a pleasure to welcome you uh, on behalf of the University of Cape Town. Uh, my name is Diane Midi. I'm uh, Vice Chancellor of Pension at UCT, and uh, it's my pleasure to, to host this evening. Um, our lecturer, of course, as you know, is Professor Olivia Cairncross, who's um, head of surgery in the Faculty of Health Sciences. Uh, allow me to introduce the platform party. Uh, on my on my right, we have Professor Graham Cleveland. Is the head of Morris Marlowe Chair and Head of Surgery. And we have a lecture on his right hand side. And then Ms. Noe Mdali of the People's Health Movement of Southern Africa, who will later on deliver a vote of thanks. And Professor Olawani Ramdonga, who is the Deputy Vice Chancellor for Transformation, Student Affairs and Social Responsiveness. And then Professor Ryan Green Thompson at the far end, uh, who's the Dean of the Faculty of Health Sciences, will deliver, um, will deliver the closing remarks. So, um, friends, and colleagues, ladies and gentlemen, um, inaugural lectures are a very special event in the life of the university. They mark the, the ascent, if you like, to full professorship, which is the highest academic rank to which a, an academic staff member may aspire. And it's one which any serious scholar will wish to achieve at some stage in their, in their career. Uh, whether one is appointed to the rank or promoted to full professorship, either way, uh, it constitutes recognition of the stature of the scholar and of the high quality and the impact of their work. The process leading to becoming a professor is an extremely arduous one. The criteria are extremely demanding, and so one prizes the rank all the more. In order, lectures provide an opportunity to celebrate, of course, the achievements of the lecturer, the individual, but they also provide us with an opportunity um, to hear from the inaugural lecturer something about their work, um, what they've achieved, um, what their ambitions are, and also importantly, really, to convey to all of us an idea of the of the of the, of the quality of their work, but also the nature of their work in a way that would be accessible to a broad audience, which this certainly is. Um, I should uh, 
in particular, in addition to welcoming everybody here, also welcome members of Professor Ken Ken Cross's family. It's lovely to have you here with us this evening. Um, so, with regard, I suppose, to what the Northern Lectures are all about, uh, let me mention that last year, Global Health Action, the online journal, published a report about a groundbreaking workshop in Cape Town that was described as, and I quote, the first of its kind to generate evidence on the delays to surgical care in South Africa, unquote. The article reported that deaths caused by conditions that could have been treated successfully by surgery, but were not, outnumber the deaths from tuberculosis, HIV, AIDS, and malaria combined in low to middle income countries. Only around 3.5% of roughly 234 million major surgical operations performed worldwide are undertaken in low resource countries. So by inviting Professor Cairncross to increase our understanding of her work through this inaugural lecture, we, I'm sure, will build our understanding of the background to this vast inequality in the domain of healthcare and of the complex intersections and interactions between delivering a surgical service on the one hand and the pursuit of formal academic medicine. Uh, so ladies and gentlemen, with that, uh, it's my pleasure now to invite Professor Fegan to the podium to introduce Professor Kainos. Thank you. Distinguished platform party, uh, inaugural lecture of Professor Ken Cross, um, Professor Tombo Vanica and Lubumile, uh, uh, Lydia's family, and um, Lydia's parents. I'm not sure they're here yet. Uh, Dr. Sophie Christine Ken Cross, who's a, actually a medical graduate of the faculty, a very distinguished medical graduate who went on to become uh, director of, of HIV AIDS in the workplace at the International Labour Organization. and uh, and Lydia is that Professor Eugene Kenkos. Um, we hope that they'll be here uh, soon to join us. And also uh, Lenore, Sister and Emil, who's online, Lydia's little brother. So I was very honoured when, when Lydia asked me to do this introduction. Uh, but I felt a bit intimidated because how do you begin to uh, encompass the many, many facets of, of Lydia Kenkos, who has made so many different contributions? And looking around the room and uh, all of you from different facets of, of Lydia's life and those of you online, I'm sure I won't cover everything. In fact, I don't think that she will ask me to cover everything, uh, but please forgive me if I, if I skip a few things up. So Lydia was born in South Africa, but her family moved to Zimbabwe when she was five years old. Um, and most of you will know the reason for that was that her parents were uh, politically active and it was important to make a contribution in the newly independent Zimbabwe. And uh, Lydia had 10 very happy years in Zimbabwe, but certainly grew up with a very deep understanding of what it meant to be an activist. Uh, so she returned to South Africa to complete her high school and uh, great and matriculated in Johannesburg in the new democratic South Africa. And when you talk to Lydia, you very quickly realize that however big the universe in which she operates, at the center of that universe is her family. And there's, there's absolutely no doubt that that's the center of everything. Lenore tells me that um, when they were little, um, Lydia was very, very quiet. And um, she also found it really hard to get up in the morning. And uh, Lenore found it quite irritating that she'd have to go to school and Lydia could sleep in and miss a day of school. It obviously didn't uh, really do any harm. But, um, Emil uh, happily describes growing up with three moms, with two older sisters. And um, so she remembers Lydia always being quite serious in the way she went about things a wise soul from a very young age and describes the incredible appetite for knowledge. And he describes having breakfast with Lydia a couple of years ago at Starlings, where they were talking about time management. And Lydia disclosed that she had read 40 books on time management, covering the entire ideological spectrum from radical capitalist notions of every second being valuable to a more laissez-faire sort of approach. Anyway, Lydia sort of clearly found her, her way to manage time. No doubt about that. Um, 
Lydia's mom tried to discourage her from doing medicine. And maybe can we start by acknowledging Lydia's spirit? <laughs> So after a um, failed attempt to discourage uh, Lydia from doing medicine and many attempts to divert her with ballet and music and drama and all sorts of other things, uh, she decided to, to follow the family tradition and come to UCT, where both her parents were had graduated, her dad was a chemical engineer and her mum was a doctor. And she not only came to UCT and studied medicine, but she absolutely excelled and graduated with first class honours a spectacular academic career ahead of her. So Lydia then went to um, the Eastern Cape, well first went to George for internship and then did community service in the Eastern Cape, then with a time overseas before returning to South Africa, intent on becoming a surgeon. And once again, her mum's attempts to persuade her that another career might, might be more suitable actually were overruled. And uh, I think we can really say the rest is history. So Lydia started her surgical training under Professor Del Khan, who's here. Uh, in 2004 at Fritzke, and Del says it was very immediately obvious that Lydia was destined for great things, and Lydia credits Del as being a really influential and supportive mentor. Um, one, one of the things that got off to a good start was that uh, Lydia's mum had been an intern for Del, he had been registrar, and he did say that you're a very good intern. <laughs> Obviously uh, carried on from one generation to another. Um, unsurprisingly, when Lydia completed her college exam, she won the Douglas Medal for the best candle in the country, for the College of Surgeons exam that right year. Unsurprised as uh, head, of, head of department was, uh, even less surprised was her fellow registrar, Adam Brutal, who had the misfortune of being in a study group with Lydia and he describes the incredible misery of feeling extraordinarily stupid. <laughs> And so he was quite reassured when she got the medal. He didn't feel quite so stupid. He also told me, and I, I think many of us in the room would share this notion that uh, Lydia's final year class voted her the person most likely to become Minister of Health. <laughs> 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 that so after a year um, as a consultant, where else other than Somerset Hospital, uh, Lydia returned to Cripsgate to pursue specialist training, uh, subspecialist training rather, in endocrine and breast surgery and another very influential mentor, Professor Eugenio Paneri. We also very quickly saw her potential and handed over management of that firm within a couple of years of Lydia competing in training. The Eugene speaks highly of Lydia's integrity and ethics, that she always does what's right as opposed to what's convenient. When she believes in something, she acts as opposed to talking about it. She's a hard worker, and I guess there's a perspective there, as most surgeons are, <laughs> um, being a fellow surgeon Eugene. And, and also says that um, she gets stuff done. She values clinical medicine and training. She doesn't seek or bask in public affirmation and is often quite embarrassed by it. I really admire diplomatic skills in the way she negotiates conflict and situations of conflict with calm and reason. Her communication skills are outstanding. So I could say an awful lot more about the ways in which Lydia improved the clinical service uh, in her time running the, the breast and endocrine service the amazing NGO that she worked with, uh, Project Flamingo and Pink Drive, the management of leadership skills that really came to the fore during COVID, working very closely with uh, Fritzke's CEO, Dr. Bhavna Patel, and one of, one of the great South Africans, Dr. MTL Suleiman, who is in the room, thank you, MTL, being here today, and gift of the givers to, to, to really launch the surgical recovery program, together with her work outside of the hospital, the People's Health Movement. Uh, all of these achievements, um, uh, led, to, led to Lydia being named as one of the Mail and Guardian's 50 most powerful women in 2022, together with Salome Maswini. So Salome says that Lydia volunteered to help establish global surgery, uh, this newly um, established discipline at, at UCT, and took over um, advocacy and community engagement. He's an amazing world-class surgeon, deeply passionate and interested in the patient as a human being. And on a Saturday, it's not rare to find her in a township or community meeting teaching about cancer or talking about human rights. So one of Lydia's um, mentees, um, Dr. Hunadi Malabi, describes Lydia as a woman who wears many hats and is proud of every one of them. Juggling a career, clinical duties, wife, mother, daughter, mentor, community advocate, as if that's not enough. 
Uh, her kids persuaded her to get a dog. <laughs> that clearly became child number three, so <laughs> uh, requiring as much attention. She's also very flexible. Um, that week when it really rained a lot in Cape Town, so Satomba and Lydia decided to go camping and see the So they hired a camper, a caravan, and they were having a great time until they realized that the kids were not having such a good time. So they threw the towel and booked into the lodge, so flexible and the, and the duress as well. So, so Lydia has, um, it, in terms of the different people who've mentored her, it'd be very hard to talk about Lydia without mentioning our former Dean, Marion Jacobs. I'm looking at the room to Marion. Marion was here earlier. Yes, Marion. So Marion describes Lydia's commitment to primary health care and says, as a super duper brilliant surgeon working in a specialist hospital, maybe surprising that Lydia is especially well known as an advocate for primary health care and approach to health care, which is essential, ethical, accessible, equitable, affordable, and accountable to the community. Lydia has consistently applied all of these domains seamlessly to her health care practice and her commitment for social justice from the operating theatre of the poorest communities. As such, she's a beacon of inspiration to students, her peers, and especially the marginalized members of society who are at the very heart of her care. I also discovered one of the reasons that Marion has such an amazing way with words. And I believe Lydia's grandfather was one of Marion's English teachers. <laughs> so things come around in circle. So the impact of Lydia's work in healthcare uh, has also drawn the admiration of our head of health, who's also here today, uh, Dr. Keith Duty. And uh, Keith says he appreciates how she brings a deep sense of social justice to her role as a healthcare provider and academic in a very mindful and intentional manner, connected to humanity in a steadfast way with a connection to both the family and the community. So there are many other influential people, and I'm not going to go through them all, but I think just for those of you who would really like to understand sort of Lydia at, at, a, at a deeply intellectual, philosophical level, I really recommend you read the speech that she gave, an incredibly powerful and moving speech at the opening of the Neville and Alexander in 2015. So we've heard from Lydia's family and from her colleagues, both in surgery and, and in the wider sort of healthcare space. Um, but I think the picture wouldn't be complete without the views of a couple of her comrades from Struggle Road and ongoing comrades, uh, Dr. Leanne Maidu from the School of Education and Professor Lacey London from the School of Public Health. So the start with Leanne, uh, who writes, one of the most important things about Lydia is that she's a socialist. She grew up in a family committed to organizing to the left of the ANC in the, in the anti-apartheid struggle. Her parents are both socialist scientists, which is a rare and wonderful thing. Lydia was raised in a context of extraordinary commitment to collective well-being and, ra and radical non-racialism, while also understanding that excellence of science on scientific studies should always be used for the purpose of the common good. It's also a tradition of seriously disciplined people. The discipline goes way beyond the boundaries of medicine. Lydia is always thinking and worrying about how to understand and fix giant problems. She does this in calm but fierce determination. If she doesn't know something, she'll find a book or five to read. <laughs> um, and always brings the most searching questions put in the political conversation with her comrades. She's much respected and loved by everyone close to her. And the last word, of course, let's go to Leslie. So Leslie recalls many years ago, very quiet once again, softly spoken, but very determined young medical student coming into the office as a fourth year student doing her community health block to ask to take a few days leave to attend a conference. So there's a bit of a surprise, an unusual request from an undergraduate student to go to a conference. So he asked what conference uh, she was going to, and he was Quite stunned when she replied that she wanted to go to a conference of the Fourth International. <laughs> <laughs> so, for, for those of you who don't know the Fourth International, it is the most extreme left wing Trotskyist movement on the planet. And the prospect, really? UCT medical students going to Fourth International? Of course. I, I think you paid for a ticket. <laughs> So, so Leslie said, you're so impressed, you could not refuse the request of this. What did Ru Rudolf Burkhoff said, and then medicine is politics on a grand scale. I thought, well, I'll never have another medical student ask me to attend the conference of the Fourth International. And you know what? I haven't. <laughs> I think it comes from being the daughter of two remarkable parents who have also devoted their lives to social justice. Lydia is both fierce and friendly, 
permanent flexible pair and pencil that constantly actually where they can make a difference. Quite the incredible package. It is now my great pleasure to invite Professor Lydia Kankos, Professor and Chair of General Surgery, and Head of the Department of Surgery, to give an inaugural lecture entitled From Endocrine Surgery to Access to Care, the Imperative Health Equity Action in Academic Development. Thank you very much. Thank you, Graham, for that amazing introduction. Um, those who know me will know that I, I struggle with the introductions and even trying to ask people to keep them really short. Um, and I think, um, Graham, you, you've overstepped your time by, by a wild mile um, and taken a little bit of mine. But thank you very much um, for that beautiful school introduction and for sharing so many different anecdotes and for outing me as, a, as an attendant if I conference. Um, so um, colleagues and friends, thank you first of all to everyone for being here today. Represented in this room are professional surgical colleagues, health social movement activists, managers, senior leadership in health, humanitarian leaders and political comrades, friends, family extended and close, uh, my husband and kids um, and it's a very special moment to see all of you here today. A special acknowledgement to um, Keith Pitty, thank you very much for coming to my role. I'm very appreciative. And um, to Imtia Suleiman for being here as well today. Um, wow, thank you. It's, uh, it's great to have you here. Um, and um, I'm not sure if I, I saw Barna earlier as well, but to the health leadership. To Barna, thank you very much. Um, and to Anita as well. You know, Barna is my CEO, so it's uh, it's fantastic to have her here as well and, and listening to me. Um, so I'm truly honored to have every single person that's here today here. And in the next, um, well, it's not 40 minutes anymore because I've lost a bit of time. Uh, in the next uh, few minutes, I'm going to take you on a little bit of a journey. Um, I'm hoping to tell you a little bit about what it means to become a surgeon in this rich and exasperating country with all its complexities. I'll tell you a little bit about my research, some of the adventures of being a leader in an academic department, and then I'll offer some comment on the big question, what is to be done? Um, so when I was a medical student, I had no idea what I was going to specialize in. I loved all aspects of clinical medicine. My colleagues told me that I was too clever for surgery. Um, and, and my friends told me I was too impatient for internal medicine. Um, I loved the public health aspect of pediatrics and the intense focus of anesthesia. But it was while I was an intern doing my second cesarean section that I first thought, wow, oh, maybe I can be a surgeon. And what opened that small door for me was the medical officer that I was operating with. Mm -hmm. and, and they just made a comment saying, you operate quite well. Maybe you must think about doing surgery. And it really struck me that such a, um, a small fleeting comment from a colleague at that crucial point in your career can make a big difference. Um, and for us to remind, remind you of that with our junior colleagues when we work with them. My internship and community service were in George Livingston and Tata, and I lived the life of a junior doctor, which is a blur of work and calls and sleeplessness and not sure where you're going to eat next. Um, and that forged a lot of what I thought of and became at that time. And at the end of my internship, I really was struggling with what is this medical career that we're busy with and are we actually making a difference? Um, and, and it was my mom that sent me um, the book, Love, Medicine and Miracles which is written by a cancer surgeon, Bernie Siegel, and spoke about the incredible um, importance of the patient's participation in their own healing. Um, and then in my community service year, um, it's quite kitsch, but I read the dressing station. Sorry, Adam. Um, and, and the dressing station is written by a South African surgeon um, at, at the point at, in war zones. So the dressing station is the first point of contact between victims of war and the health system. And I was really moved by the romanticism of saving lives at the front line. Um, of course, I don't do trauma now. I'm sorry, I see Soren and, and Pradeep in the room. Um, but it really moved me to think it's OK to, to know a lot, but what can you do with your hand? And that's where I, I thought surgery would come in. And then I think the book uh, Mountains Beyond Mountains, also found on my mom's bookshelf, actually, 
um, really gave me a greater faith in what we were doing in medicine as a whole, telling the story very beautifully and eloquently of Paul Farmer, uh, who passed away quite recently. Um, the long and the short of it is that I decided to train to become a surgeon, and Professor Khan was instrumental in that. Um, he met me at a after a seminar at Livingston Hospital. Um, Sats Pillay complained that you always came and stole the medical officers from the back of his day. Um, and six months later, offered me a job um, in surgery. Um, and ever since then, it was a part of throughout my surgical career, was a profound influence, um, encouraging me to become an academic surgeon. I wanted to be a district surgeon, working, doing the real work, close to the people in a small hospital as a generalist. Professor Khan said, no, it's a bad idea. Um, and uh, he's like, you should do academic medicine. And I chafed and I eventually came around. And of course, I had to conceive some years later that you were right because of God. And this is not even now too. Um, and it was the right thing to do because I hadn't realized the reach of the university and an academic career, which was far beyond the individual patient that we that we treat. So registrarship was what it is for surgeons and the registrars that are in the room remember this and are living it acutely. Um, it's both exhausting but also a very special time in the life of a surgeon. We're introduced to the thrill of, of saving a life. You go from doing small operations to bigger and bigger and more complex ones and eventually you're actually the person that made the difference between life and death. It's, it's quite thrilling. Um, and of course we're awake when everyone is asleep except the animators. Um, and, uh, and we walk the corridors and, you know, there's the mantra of you sleep when you can sleep and you eat when you can eat and you don't mess with the pancreas. Um, <laughs> and, and, um, and so it's thrilling and it's thrilling and exciting and you can survive that exhaustion if you're working in a place um, where you feel that you are valued, that you are included, that you're making a difference. And I would love for us to be creating that for our surgical trainees today, because I know that it is as hard, possibly harder now, as it was then. Um, so then I had to decide kind of what kind of surgery to do, because you know, it never ends. You never arrive with this medicine business. You know, you get the MBCHB and then you get a specialization and then they say, what are you going to do now? Um, and in my junior consultant here, um, Ami Muller, who was then head of the transplant unit with Professor Khan, encouraged me to rather do transplant surgery. And her reason was that the two of us were very similar height. Eugenio <laughs> <laughs> Panieri is much, much taller than I am. And, and she's like, you're never going to see over the patient if you operate them. Um, but, but what I did is that I started to use a bunkie in theatre. So I started with a bunkie in all my operations. It puts me at the ideal height. And in fact, now, often in theatre, you'll find everyone's on the bunkie. So we're all going up. Uh, it doesn't make any sense, but it's become the way that I operate. And I don't know in another way. So I went into to endocrine, breast and sarcoma surgery. Um, and it's an interesting mix of um, very delicate operations and very big operations to remove large retroperitoneal tumours. And, you know, in the room of the operating theatre, um, we tiptoe just beneath the skin and arrange and rearrange and reconstruct places that have gone wrong. And when we're fully there in that moment, there's a flow and a focus which makes surgery a combination of art and science. And we hold the person on the table literally in our hands. And that immense responsibility and that trust that the patient places in us is something that we need to hold sacred as surgeons. And what makes that patient safe on the table is a complex combination of things. It's the relationship that we as a surgeon has with that patient, knowing not only their pathology, but also the person themselves. How much risk would they want to take in a particular moment in the operation? How do they understand their, their recovery and healing? And then it requires a team. Can't do an amazing operation without an amazing anesthetist on the other end of the table, without a skilled scrub sister and an anesthetic nurse and a machine that works and a CSSC that cleans the instruments and a porter that's brought the patient down and a theatre that's been cleaned by a general assistant and a clerk in the ward that labelled the correct patient to come down to the correct operation. So in order to do surgery safely, you need a functional health system. That makes it very difficult to do safe surgery, but it also means that if you get it right, we help the whole system 
the whole health system to rise and to be better and to be as good as it can possibly be for our patients. So I give you a glimpse into that world of surgery because sometimes you don't hear surgeons talking about the joy that they experience when they're working in theatre and the intense bright lights of the operating room. And I know many of the surgeons in the audience here can relate to what I'm saying. I just wanted to honour that here as well tonight. Um, so it's it's expected, I think, at the organs that you speak about your research. And I'm going to do that. And I'm going to try and give you a few snapshots of some of the interesting things that I've been involved with and the people that I've worked with. So first of all, to say that I've authored between 40 and 50 peer reviewed publications. Now that doesn't sound like a lot. I know Sir Tom has got more than I have. It's a constant struggle in our house. Um, but, um, but it's it's surprising for me because I was a very reluctant academic. Um, I was reluctant and I had an unease about this intense focus that was placed on your research output and your citations. And it seemed to overshadow the importance of our clinical work and overshadow the importance of our systems building and the changes that we need to see in the health system. So it took me a little while to come around to seeing the importance of research in its purest form which is thinking of something that is bothering you or that you notice, asking an important question, having scientific rigor in the way that you answer it, and then publishing it in a place where the people who need to read that article are going to read that, whether that be a local, international or other journal. So my very first, um, actually my first article was a case study with Pradeep Nasaria. So Pradeep, I don't know if you remember, um, Thank you guys remember, so thank you for me. Um, and then my my first sort of full research uh, project was at Red Cross Hospital um, with uh, Professor Alistair Miller, and it was on composite sarcoma, so I had helped to resuscitate a young child who was bleeding from, from her stomach, and it was caused by this rare cancer, which is associated with HIV. Um, anyway, so we looked and we gathered a series together, but what stands out about this publication is that it took me probably a month to get paperwork through ethics and then another two months to collect the data and then I submitted it to the journal and then it was accepted with no revisions and then I was invited to an international conference to present on the podium and I'm like wow this is such thing no it's okay um, <laughs> needless to say um, that's not how it always goes <laughs> Um, and I set the bar very high for my research experience, and I don't think I've ever achieved it since then. And, and my most recent publication um, came out yesterday, and it's the Lancet Oncology Commission on Global Cancer Surgery, um, where I've written a chapter about how you set up surgical cancer systems in the resource um, health settings, and how you have a pragmatic and yet optimistic approach to, to doing that. Um, Breast cancer was a big part of my early work. Um, I worked with Jennifer Moodley on the public health aspects of breast cancer and with Professor Adida on the immunology around cancer. And this exciting idea that if we can harness the body's immune system to fight cancer in situ, this might be a much better way to treat the conditions. And I'm still very excited about that. And if we set up our lab, I really want to look at that. I just want to acknowledge Liana Ruet founder of uh, Project Flamingo, and she worked with us on improving the health system in the breast clinic. So I don't know people here who, who know the, I mean, those in the service know about the breast clinic, but the Friday breast clinic at Fruiterscare is kind of famous. So it was this huge clinic that was set up, initially not so big by Professor Dent, as a one-stop clinic for women with symptoms that could be breast cancer. Um, it was a very successful clinic and quite rapidly became a victim of its own success. Uh, with upwards of 8,000 women coming through the clinic, diagnosing 600 cancers a year. And we spend a lot of our time, myself and Eugene, and later Francois, trying to find ways to make the service sustainable. And one of those ways was through funded Saturday surgical lists, funded by Project Flamingo, and all the surgeons in the team, they still do it now, once a month on a Saturday, we'll do a Flamingo project list, which keeps our breast cancer um, waiting times down. 
2017, I went on sabbatical to London and I just, I did go there to learn about sarcomas and Eugene, I did learn about, a bit about sarcomas. <laughs> but the main thing I learned there was um, that you should go on sabbatical. <laughs> so it's really, really good to get out of your health system, to see another place, to experience the way people do things elsewhere. I also learned I, that if you have data systems that work well, it's easy to do research. So this was a paper that I managed to publish also very quickly because all the data was there. And the third thing I brought home was the telephone clinic, which was telemedicine before the COVID pandemic hit. So we managed to change a big part of our breast clinic into a virtual clinic where we would phone patients with results, really transforming the experience both for the clinicians and for the patients. We all know what happened in 2020 in the health system. Um, this is just a snapshot of some of the articles that came through during COVID. COVID was a strange time. Some people were home at home um, alone and very quiet and, and had much time to worry. And others in the health system, their work accelerated exponentially clinically and in terms of research. And I think from the COVID experience, we learned how to set up a hospital response to the pandemic. Um, myself and, and Adam Guichal, Professor Guichal, um ran the surgical component of that response. Um, and it was a it was a, quite a difficult and dark time. I think what I remember most is um, those difficult decisions where you have to stop the theater list and open the ICU beds. If you don't open the ICU beds, young patients are dying because they're not prepared to date. And if you close the theater list, the waiting times for our patients would expand. So it was a really difficult time. Um, and from that, we learned how to work together and also what to do after, after the recovery. And this is my last research snapshot. Um, so Professor Salome Maswime um, brought global surgery under the leadership of Graham Fiegen to, to UCT. And when I was listening to Salome and thinking around cancer on a bigger scale, I realized it's not about the individual cancers, that all patients who present with cancer, for them to have good care, a few things have to be in place. People need to know when they have a symptom that could be a cancer. When they go to a clinic, the clinic nurse or the doctor needs to know what the symptom is. They need to have access then to radiology, to histology and diagnostics. And then they need access to safe surgery. And that's how I became involved in the Lancet Commission on global cancer surgery, struck by the, the vast differences in outcomes between patients in urban and rural areas, patients in the global north and the global south, patients in the Western Cape and the Eastern Cape, really starting to look at what is it that's going on in our cancer care that is so unequal. So there was one more snapshot. Um, so, and when I became head of division, you'll see that the research kind of follows the career path. When I became head of division of general surgery, in 2022, I started to grapple with this issue of training, how we train a surgeon, what makes a good surgeon? Um, how do you assess technical ability? How do you assess professional skills? What is it that you want people to learn? Um, and this is a, an article authored as a further author by Daniel now. And Daniel and I have worked as co-creating really a postgraduate training program which looks at assessing registrars within the workplace. Um, and making sure as far as we can that the surgeons we send out into the world are surgeons that we would be happy for our, par our parents and our siblings and our children to be operated upon. And that is what, what we aspire to do. Um, and the comment I think on teaching, obviously it's not only postgraduate students but also undergraduates. I wasn't really sure where the head of general surgery was the thing I wanted to do. There's a lot of management and administration and HR and recruitment and interviews and rotations and stuff that goes with that job. But the thing that convinced me was the power of reach that education and teaching and learning brings. So every year, 220 undergraduate students go through the Department of Surgery in fifth and sixth year. And as a student, I distinctly remember my tutorials from my lecturers in 12th and 16th. I remember Professor Immelman telling me about a crash on the N2. And after the crash, this patient has got a liver injury. And what are you going to do? And are you going to pack the liver? How are you going to pack the liver? 
And I remember the, the enthusiasm and the storytelling that it brought into his teaching and how that has stayed with me. I remember, you know, the way I do a thyroidectomy is the way Eugene does a thyroidectomy. And Gunadi does it very similarly because she learned from me. And so when we teach well, we develop a subtle form of immortality because people remember the way we do things and what we have taught reverberates generations down the line. So there is truly joy in teaching. So I took over from Graham Fiegan 10 months ago, it was 11, or it was Graham about to. So Graham mentioned that there was a lot in the job, but he wasn't very specific. <laughs> um, and there are many parts to being an HOD in an academic department. Um, and I've tried to separate them out a bit in my mind so I can make sense of this crazy thing um, that we're involved with. So as an HOD, as an academic person, you need to lead. And leadership for me is about creating vision and inspiring people. We need to manage as well. And management is about having the right people in the right job with the right training and the right support and the right processes around them. We need administration, which works. And administration is about protocols and paperwork. It's about making sure that salary slips are delivered and that salaries get paid. And these things are really important. Um, and then as an HOD, you also need to be a clinician. You need to be a surgeon. You can't, I think, step away from that without being unmuted. And you still need to do your research and teaching. So I did this exercise to try and fit this all into 100%. Now, I must tell you, I sat with a pie chart for a long time because it just doesn't fit. Um, so this is an aspirational time chart of what I would like to do as an HOD, how I would like to spend my time. I'd like to spend most of my time in leadership and clinical um, teaching and training and clinical work. So 60% of that. I believe that we need strong management and some of my time must be spent on that. And administ administration and research are there too. Now, I won't tell you how far off from this aspirational chart I am at the moment. But suffice to say that many of our systems don't work well and many of our systems are broken. And many of our systems are not people and person centered. And that means that people don't have energy to do the work that they need to do because they're caught up in the bureaucracy. And the bureaucracies that we deal with in medicine, so we have the university, we have the provincial department of health, we have the HPCSA, and we have the colleges of medicine. Um, so, I mean, to put it mildly, I've spent quite a lot of time thinking philosophically about the role of bureaucracy in our lives. <laughs> and I think for me, leaders, leaders need to ensure that things run well and things run smoothly. Because if they don't run well, you can't steer the ship anyway if the ship is sinking. So we need to fix the things that don't work well. And I've spent quite a bit of my time this year. I hope things will be better. Part of the bureaucracies are beyond these walls and beyond what we can do. But um, leadership and management needs to include paying attention to those things. So, um, so I could potentially stop my inaugural lecture here, but, but I won't. Firstly, I still got time, I think. <laughs> um, and secondly, I think there is. I think that we need to widen the lens of what we're doing. So I've presented to you a fairly um, traditional academic pathway. I became a surgeon. I found something. It's a very cool area of surgery. Any kind of surgery is the best. Um, <laughs> Um, and some of the research things that I've done. But now I want to talk a little bit about the things that can't be cited um, and that don't count towards my publication count. Um, and I've got five anecdotes to, to speak to you because I think it's important for, for where we are and what we're doing and how. So when I was an intern and community service doctor, I worked in the Eastern Cape. And I worked both geographically and by time in the storm of the HIV pandemic. Um, the HIV pandemic was out and to the We still remember how many patients we lost, how many patients we allowed um, ourselves to lose. Um, and it's one of the reasons that I decided to do surgery actually, because 
that are struggling with, with that complexity. But in my community service year, um, I started working with some legal activists in the UK um, because their hospital had published an edict that they would no longer treat HIV positive patients. They put it on the wall outside the door of us. Um, and this community was, of course, outraged and connected with them. And we started organizing tickets and pamphlets and protests and eventually a treatment action campaign branch in Vietnam. And that treatment action campaign branch I set up with Anele Gawa. Anele is now General Secretary of the TAC. And through that initial work, I got to some of the national meetings of the TAC. And I saw a few things. First of all, I saw people who were HIV positive, singing, dancing, being healthy. They weren't died in our wars, and that was because of antiretrovirals. I saw activists taking on the stigma of this disease, this um, um, the, everything associated with it, and rising up and saying we want to do something different. And I saw the TLC's treatment literacy of communities and the intense power of community leadership, teaching and learning about the details of the illnesses that they have, the drugs they need to take, the side effects. And I was really struck by the fact that we're so arrogant those medical professionals. We don't believe that people can understand things in that way. But I really learned that lesson when working with the TAC. In 2007, it's my next of a couple of anecdotes. Um, we had a big budget cut, um, which was visited on the tertiary hospitals, mainly the tertiary hospitals, but it was broader than that. Um, Professor Khan, I don't know if you remember this picture. Um, and Professor Khan and Professor Mayosi stood up. And um, so, Bhavna, we, we have the same picture, and yours is the better one. Um, <laughs> and um, stood up and they, they broke the silence on that budget cut. They, they explained what it meant if we lost 90 beds and if we lost staff. And that protest in Palm Court by those two professors catalyzed a community-wide protest involving trade unions, civil society movements, TAB, People's Health Movement and others. And this is us at the provincial budget hearings where we presented our petition signed by many of the commissions in this hospital. Um, and this quote here is actually something that a 2007 me said, that conditions in the public sector are such that we cannot afford to lose even one bed, a single clinic, or a single health worker at any level of care. Cuts to health budgets cause death and suffering. I think the same is true today. Um, just a word on the People's Health Movement and the community workshops, which Noe and I have worked together on. The People's Health Movement is of South Africa is one of many uh, country movements, and the People's Health Movement is a um, social movement campaigning for the rights to health across the world and campaigning for equity within health. Um, we have done workshops in Guduletu, Philippi, Nyanga, Manenberg, Haidicha, Philippi, Philippi Store, I'm sure I'm missing some of them, and some of those community participants are here today. And those community workshops are small group workshops where we have learning that goes in both directions. I'm learning, they're learning. I have some medical expertise and I'm learning about community <laughs> and mobilization. And what does it feel like to use the health system that we provide? And I must tell you, it often doesn't feel good. So the health system is fragmented, it's often impersonal, often people don't know what the next step is. So that's been a, a major part of my learning and my journey. Um, the university is a contested space, and um, part of my, I suppose, growing up as an academic in this university was influenced by the protests of 2016. So we know that um, in 2016, the youth of this country at the three uh, institutions of learning shone a spotlight on one of the inequity of living in a country where the working class people of this country 
those that could overcome the disadvantage of their education and get into university, they still found that they, they couldn't excel because they couldn't afford the fees. And those that could get in and couldn't get the fees and landed in the university felt that they didn't belong in the university. They didn't feel like it was a home for them. And so the campaign to for free and decolonized education was something that really struck me and, and profoundly impacted on, on how I felt and thought at that time. Um, we've mentioned Neville Alexander and the opening of the building, which was in 2015, and I was um, invited to give the inaugural at that meeting. And it struck me that many of the things that Neville had spoken about in his writings on anti-racism, in his writings on class and society, were coming true before our eyes in the university after his death. And it's impossible for me to, to talk about um, what happened at that time without speaking a little bit about Professor Mayosi, um, the incredible impact that his life and his work and his untimely death had on me as an individual, on us all as an institution, um, and my perspectives at that time. I think for me, he remains our best and our brightest, um, and we hold him forever high, and we forever mourn his loss. My last anecdote, and it was to wife. So, deep in the third wave, we were asked to open a COVID ward, we in surgery, in E4 Theatre. E4 Theatre had been built during the COVID pandemic, but had never been used for surgery. It had only been used for as a COVID ward and as high care for COVID. And that wave was so long and so deep and so difficult that in order for us to get through it as surgeons, we had to imagine something on the other side. And the thing that we imagined was, what about if we did operations in this brand new theatre? And people were like, well, we don't have the staff, we don't have the money, it's not going to be possible. And we're like, well, let's put together a proposal and maybe we'll find the money. Um, Bhagna Patel one evening sent a message quite late saying, MTS Suleiman is coming to the hospital tomorrow. Come to a meeting and present your plans. And we presented our plan and thank you MTS because you sparked the donation towards surgical recovery, which allowed us then to run that theatre and do 1,500 operations in the first year. And to date we're looking at over 2,400 operations that have been done just in that E4 theatre. Now that is an alliance, a partnership of clinicians who want to do something different. Hospital managers who are prepared to be imaginative and get on board. Of the hospital trust who supported us with fundraising. Of humanitarian organizations like Gift of the Givers. And the public of Cape Town. So Cape Town and beyond, people donated to this project. And I feel that it's helped us in surgery to keep our heads above water. Do we have long waiting lists still? Yes, we do. I think so difficult, yes, they are, but we've caught up quite a lot. And it's made a very big difference, at least in my team, and I hope in the teams of happy surgeons in this room. So thank you very much to everybody who made that possible. So I'm coming to the end, and I just want to comment on, on where we find ourselves now. Um, so I've spent many, many, many days in meetings in the last few weeks talking about austerity, Austerity in health and austerity in education. Um, this is an article that came out today, Medical Day Zero, about the tertiary hospitals in Cape Town. Um, this hospital that we're standing in right here has a 260 million budget cut for the financial year. Um, and we, as managers, leaders, clinicians, are being asked to implement these cuts that we were not part of deciding, that we were not party to the political decisions that resulted in this position that we're in now. Um, I'm mindful that I'm sitting here with senior leadership of health, and the last time I spoke about budget cuts, I was almost fired. Um, but that's not going to happen now, I'm sure. Um, but um, we we are facing a, a very serious crisis, much, much bigger than 2007. So, so what happens when what happens when the health budget is cut is the first thing that happens is you can't fill your post. What does a post mean? It's a health worker. So it's a nurse 
or a doctor or a medical officer or a surgeon that was there and is no longer there. The next thing that happens is you run out of the things that you need in order to do your work. So the drugs and the, the implants for operations and so on. And then you start losing the health workers because they can't cope, those that are left behind. So we're already standing on the precipice now. If we allow this level of cuts, 10% of the health budget, this level of cuts to go through, it's a threat to the very core of our health service. And we have a responsibility that is not only to the patients of today, not only the health workers of today, but also those of tomorrow, to hold the line and to prevent the breakdown of those services. So what is the role of the university in all of this? So um, in our universities, we have the resources for analysis, for research, for publication, and we have the relative protection of academic freedom. We need to make those privileges count. We need to mobilize to intervene in our country's trajectory, and we need to do that now. We need to mobilize and intervene in our country's trajectory in alliance with communities and movements who are already doing so. There are people outside of the academic space already doing that. And that mobilization is around water, housing, land, education, health. But specifically in health, what does it mean? It means that we as heads of surgery, heads of ops and gynae, heads of medicine, heads of all the head stuff that we are, we need to be talking to our colleagues in other provinces and building a collective voice. I need to be phoning the head of FITS and KZN and SMU and all the other universities and say, what are we going to do about the budget cuts in health? And what kind of statement can we make here? I want to see the committee of deans do something similar. Every single dean of a health science faculty needs to be standing up and saying, how are we going to train the next generation of health workers when we don't have a health system left? And I will challenge the College of Medicine to do the same thing and hopefully the HDCSA as well. It is not enough for us to say our politicians are failing us and let's wait for the next vote that comes. We have a greater responsibility than that, and I believe this moment is our call to action. And beyond this, I feel that in our university space, we need to consciously find spaces where we create that kind of thinking and that kind of narrative around social justice. We don't live in a neutral society. We're not in a society where the playing fields are even and you can choose which side you want to be on. The playing fields are not even. We know that our society is dominated by those who have power in terms of wealth, by the north over the global south, by the haves over the have-nots. And as an, as an academy, as an academic institution, we have to be conscious about how we develop the critique of that narrative. Not easy because the university funding comes from many of those places, comes from the industry, comes from corporate. The research funding often comes from research agencies and funding uh, places in the global north. So we need to be intentional about it. And the kind of space that I would love to see is where we bring together as a center or as an institute or as some kind of organization in the university space. Um, a social justice network around health and education, because health and education are, are partnered in all things. Such a space has got enough autonomy to be able to think critically, speak out, and help to hold accountability, because we need to hold our state accountable for what is happening in our country. Um, and we have the gravity and authority to do this, I believe. That's the end of the formal part of my talk. Um, I just want to say a few thank yous um, to my clinical team. And yeah, I have to read, otherwise I'm going to miss out some people. Um, currently led by Professor Malerba, and uh, to Chancellor Nadia Liana, thank you very much. Um, to the whole of the Division of General Surgery, my home. Um, thank you to the consultants, the heads of clinical leaders, the registrars. And for those that are active in the website and go on holiday, I'm happy. I don't know if it's just an end. I really appreciate that I can close my laptop. Um, to the Department of Surgery and Medicine Divisions, um, those that are here in the room and those beyond, and for your support um, in providing to me and my leadership. Um, to our incredible 
um, administrative team um, led by Melissa and Michelle, um, and including Warika Brown, Simpiwe Gubane, Logan Anton, Cameron Prisix, Sistoke, Ganga Lizwe, Dr. Gile, Delika, and all the divisional administrators. Thank you very much. You are the ones that keep the ship afloat. And uh, here, Lake Management, uh, Barna Patel, Benedict Ike in my absence, Belinda Jacobs, and Srikan Peters. Thank you very much. Thank you very much to the people for the generosity of spirit. Um, to Dr. Nell, I'm not sure who is here for his work with me on the teaching platform. Um, and then to the other people in my story, um, to my sister, Lenore, um, who is the glue that holds the family together and who keeps record of the passing of time of your photographs. To my brother, Emil, who is online, I hope, um, in Amsterdam, who reminds us that you can be brilliant at your job and also still make music and be a lot of fun. Um, to my mom, at this footsteps I'm following, I walk in as the other doctor in the family and it reminds me always of the importance of service to others and respect for working people and not to forget on the personal hand. Sorry, mom, I couldn't integrate. Sure. Um, this is my dad, who I'm very pleased to see here tonight, who is the beneficiary of major surgery last week. Um, done by clinicians trained in this hospital um, and to um, love and really and same health. And thank you very much for looking after my dad. You're a testament to the excellent training that happens here. And then uh, to my dad, thank you for telling us always to get our way into a star, um, to read the great writers and to analyze the history. I hope one day to know as much as the beauty, but I don't know to go a long way off. And may you be up and running quite soon. To my kids, um, so this is the picture of them. You see, Libby's looking up now. But they were much smaller. To my beautiful children, thank you for sitting through this very long lecture. I hope it wasn't too boring. Um, to my firstborn, Lanika, thank you for your indomitable spirit, your early morning hugs, and your incredible light and joy, and for bringing music into our lives. To my little guy, Livu Mile, thank you for your many questions that help us see the world in new ways. Your drawings, your love for animals, and your famous 20 second hugs that came before it was even famous to do that. Um, thank you to Angela, who is also here tonight, um, for being a second mother to my kids and helping me through all the ups and downs of being a working mom. And at the bottom there is JJ and Jared wasn't one, but Graham was two. Um, so Jera and JJ for making sure that I keep laughing and for all the knowledge I've gained about puppyhood in my short time with us. Um, and then finally to Sitomo, who's my husband and partner, friend and fellow surgeon. Thank you for quietly putting up with my many crazy campaigns. Thank you for listening when I have midnight flight of ideas about some new activity that I want to add in. Thank you. Extremely full schedule. Um, thank you for being a bath time dad and also for the pretty surgeon and for being the secret superpower that allows me to do what I do and step into the world on the foundation of your love. Thank you. Thank you. The arc of the moral universe is long, but tends towards justice. I believe this is true, but I also believe that we have to actively bend the arc through our conscious and collective work. The world today is awash in pain and conflict from Gaza to the gathering streets of the Cape Flats. So it's easy to despair and it's easy to be cynical. It's much harder to hope and harder still to take action. But I urge myself and I urge all of you to take that parliament, to find a point of intervention in the place where you are, the place you have influence, the place where you can make a difference and to act.
so that the world we leave our children is better than the one into which we were born. Thank you. Bright in the corner where you are, be bright in the Thank you very much, Julian. Uh, it gives me pleasure now to introduce um, Ms. Miriam Day, who will in a moment deliver a vote of thanks. So, Ms. Day is the chairperson of the Google to Health Forum and a steering committee member of the People's Health Movement of South Africa. She's a community leader in the health sector in the Western Cape and beyond. She has worked with Professor Claire Cross for many years, primarily through community bi-directional learning workshops on health systems, cancer surgery, and COVID-19. So it gives me pleasure to invite Cousin Dari to present the vote as well. Thank you. Let me have a little chat um, because that yeah, the sense everything. Um, it is finally most important person. I don't play with power. What you have is my all power in the middle. I really don't play with power. Once and foremost, I want to print my core face. That's in the house, it's probably something in London. Where are you? <laughs> I'm not in the fire. You don't want to be mentioned. Yeah, he's our pioneer and community leaders. Um, I want to print, uh, you know, I'm too emotional in the end. Um, but not to uh, and, uh, and say about your, your work and your activity. 
you know, the economic state has done a successful men, management, after a successful activist. <laughs> yeah. Uh, we are so grateful to be here in the community. Um, you know, last last of last year when I was graduating uh, in university, I was hiding because I never thought of after my activism, I would end up going to school and learn in difficult time of COVID-19. But through you, you have encouraged us as community leaders that even if you have your facts, but education is the key. So you push us that, yes, you have, in spite of your policy, that Professor London always said when I do my speech or, or, or in a week now, when I, I contribute talking about um, non COVID terrorism. And I, I will say, okay, uh, I think the last thing that you must do now is educate community more. Because if let is coming and talk about cancer, there must be a side of that we take your responsibility. Never mind, I'm wearing size 50, a healthy lifestyle, eating. Then, prof, we say, no, we don't forget the politics of food. Man. Talk about <laughs> you know, uh, it is good, it's great for us. You know, in our culture as Africans, we grew up in a time that when someone is diagnosed with cancer, you don't mention that name. It's a big name, you know. But true lady are coming to our community. She breaks that stubborn brick that was between us and cancer. Because you know the fear, when we talk about more people that died of EE virus, coronavirus, they didn't die because of EE virus or pandemic. They died of fear. She came to our community and break that wall of fear of the cancer. Even you were afraid of saying, what stage? We didn't even know stages of cancer, you know? Like to shift the problem to the next person, but through you. You know, I was afraid one day when you come to the hostels and you ask me, no, you're coming from Nigeria, because of the problem. And I was saying, hey, that you know, but you, you go to that toilet, not be in mind, and uh, take things easy, like you were staying in that hostel, you know, you're your level. Your level that you brought it down. You know, you know. Yeah. I don't want to mention it. I want to put it nicely. Why are you progressing? When they finish there and forgetting where they come from. I had a case this morning, Dr. Cruz. I had a case two o'clock in our clinic. I was rushing to physical challenge person that had to lift up her stick, wanted to hit the doctor because the doctor didn't give her space telling her about the status and all that. As a chairperson of the clinic, I had to go and, and, and convince the doctor, why are you here in the clinic? We are not going to report you, we are going to sort you. You are here with them. So, uh, when we were taught the roles and responsibilities of health committees, we, we thought, you know, it's, it's small things. Then we will have become a learning network and say, you cannot stand in front of the gate and wait for the Lord when they have attitude with your mind. You must say, you know, what are the roles? How are you going to handle those cases? But we are coming to your teaching. In our communities, coming from Nigeria, and you plan and do awareness in our area. You know, if you even explain when you, 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 you put a sharp eye, you see that this person does not understand me, the language that I'm talking. You know, must have your language. So <laughs> even when you write the slip, slip, the, the slip, slip certificate, we can't even read what you. <laughs> That's right, you know.
But maybe I will come to the level that community need to understand. When I'm talking about uh, colon cancer, what is this colon cancer about? What are the interventions? What is the responsibility that I'm supposed to take as the person that needs to look after my... Because each and every... We can talk about democracy and put our legs up and say we fought all these years. But each democracy and each rights goes with the responsibilities. Each and everyone must take a responsibility. Never mind you go and march into the Dr. office and say, a right to help for our community. We need resources, budget, cards. We are coming. You know, you even told us one day, no, you know, you know, must me and perhaps, and I know when you are coming in the right manner of what you need, you saw me like, no, and you know, most when you do this, you have then I will know uh, let them go in somewhere and I'm not afraid. You know, separate issues in terms of approach. You know, you can be right uh, doing things, but if you approach, you don't know how to talk with your patient, you must forget. You can be good as you are in your level of education, but she will come and soften even the community so that you understand the language. So that at the end of the day, what are the aims and objectives is to rescue our community where we are in terms of health issues, in terms of education. But then you are you know, I can take talk to you tomorrow. That is strong uh, to you too. You know, you were raised one day, and I didn't even know that you were sitting in the car. So you get in, in that yard when the beer was educating those people about seeing coronavirus and all those pandemic. There were cars that were all in front of you, but I didn't want to say you that hey, you are in danger. Now I have to spray a play like a security so that you go safe when you go out at New Cross Road. But thank you very much to take a risk. <laughs> We are there for you, your family, your mom, my shepherd seed, all the people that movement. Uh, in that bed, we know how strong you are. We know how strong you are, and your education also is powerful and it will never prevent you. I saw the old, I saw that they also sue here. We didn't forget about Professor Sanders and Louis. Mel, are you here? All our pioneers. Thank you very much, comrades. Oh, not comrades. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Halal, Professor Lydia King. Halal. <laughs> I was going to sing Ikama Lama Kosigasi Malibongwe, but then I thought I wouldn't compete with the voices we've already heard. But it is in that spirit of gratitude that I come today to give thanks for this very special inauguration, inaugural lecture. Kasikai Gangat is the way in which the people who first lived here say thank you. And so, Lydia, today I want to say a deep thank you to you and to now who comes as part of the celebration. When you quoted your father speaking about hitching your wagon to a star, I was not going to say Pamirori Khais today, but I couldn't help it having heard that reference to the star. Because as colleagues will hear, will know that I say this often, this place where we sit, this place where we gather, was called Pamirori Khais by the first peoples of this area. And really, on this very, these very slopes of the mountain, this Huripwaka mountain, they also did medicine. So what we do in the space really is an echo of what they did. When we interviewed Lydia for this post, um, you won't mind me, Professor, that I call you Lydia every now and again. <laughs> when Lydia interviewed for this post, she refused to declare her race, as is expected in our employment equity legislation. 
And in that moment, there was a disruption of how we had this conversation, because as the panel, we're keen for race to be declared. And so we asked HR to check whether it wasn't an error. <laughs> and needless to say, there was it's not an error. And so when we engaged in that discussion, it was really about reflecting in that space about quality, about vision, and about the problems of a different future. And already, but yeah, I get a sense that that's coming through in the surgical department. Yesterday, we were at another lecture where that picture of Dal Khan and, and Mogani was shown. And, and, and it was in Bhavna's lecture yesterday, which she entitled Angels on Devil's Peak. And I thought that that's a really apt description and almost a harbinger of tonight's talk, because I think they've said, they've told a story in this generation where we've got to be so careful of single stories. They told a story which continues, but in fact offers us many promises as we go forward. I have to say, I couldn't imagine Lydia as a ballerina. <laughs> but these occasions, colleagues, and, and I have to say, I celebrate tonight just how our inaugural lectures are growing. They're growing into these celebrations of who we are as scholars, who we are as clinicians, and our intersection with the people that we claim to serve. And so previous inaugurals have invited people from private practice as the vote of thanks. I think that in itself is a significant movement. Tonight we've had a community member come to speak the thanks for one of our clinicians. I think we're growing up as a faculty. We're growing up and acknowledging all of our partners in the conversations that we want to have. And I think tonight in its, I mean, you're full this hall. I was really worried that 200 are quite, not quite the fullness of this hall. So I think there are more than 200 people here tonight. But again, the gathering as you are, students, um, I chatted to a student, I said, are you coming to the lecture? Thinking that it might be family of, of Lydia, but in fact, he's come for inspiration. And I think that's the nature of what inaugural should be for us. They should be about how people of quality in some ways start, maybe we'll not have to like that, appellation, but it's about how good scholars inspire the generations that are coming behind us and how we've got to be sure that they're better than us at every point of the way. It's also an occasion for us, Satombo, to celebrate with families. And I can't imagine what your house is like with the competition around article publication. <laughs> But I do want to, to, to pay a special celebration to you, to Lanika and to Levumile, because I think those who live in your house as a scholar and as somebody who's aspirationally uh, a leader of scholars, that's where the price is paid. And so we're really deeply grateful that it is in your house where these dreams are changed and it appears now even in the middle of the night. Uh, so we're really, really grateful to that. For that. And for the family that nurtured Lydia, I think these events for me are so much about bringing families into a space that they don't often explore. They're not often amongst us um, who claim to be scholars. So to Sophie and Eugene uh, Ken Cross, thank you very much for being with us. To Lenore, who's been part of, of Lydia's life, and to Emil, who's joined online. Let me conclude my remarks really by saying that. This is, tonight has been the epitome of an inaugural lecture for me. And in our spirit of growing them again, this is what we want to achieve, is that there are students in the room, there are communities who are ululating in celebration of the scholar. And, and, and there are other scholars from many other disciplines joining us in the conversation. This is what we, we have been aiming for over these past two years. But perhaps I want to, to close and I think in, in the gathering here, we acknowledge the fact that the Western Cape government is represented quite significantly amongst us tonight. It's, it's not a common thing and we'll work to developing it over time. The inaugural lecture is really that quintessential symbol of partnership. It's about all of the teams which together grow a scholar, the teams who together with the scholar make an impact in our world. But perhaps the thing that I'm leaving with today is the statement that Lydia made that it's often harder to hold. And our role in being essentially messengers of hope, even in our own desperation, um, 
it is this idea of hoping does demand action from all of us now here in the spheres. So thank you for being here this evening. Thank you for this incredible celebration. And I invite you then to join us for some refreshments in the foyer of the Neurosciences Institute, which is straight out there and then down the main passage to the left. Thank you very much. Can I ask you to stand as the academic procession? I, I did want to make the one last point about Lydia refusing to wear one of these hoods. She actually took it off. Um, but she really did it. But we'll leave out this way. Thank you.